Thank you all very much for inviting me to come talk about my experience working with amphibians and housing them and things that we consider uh, as we house them in the way of environmental enrichment and maybe a little bit on the social housing side. Before I get started, who are my amphibian people in the audience? Anybody? All right, good, we got a few. Great. Um, when I started in this field nearly 20 years ago, um, there wasn't really a whole lot of on enrichment in general, much less on amphibians. At that point in time, enrichment was just starting to come more into vogue with dogs and primates and having kind of these official enrichment programs. But today, we have whole facilities designed around enrichment and job descriptions on enrichment for the entire facility and all of the species. Um, probably still not as much on the way with the amphibian side. The other thing we have need to think about is when we first started housing amphibians 10 years ago at Genelia, um, we were still operating under the old guide. If you look in the 1996 guide, there was one paragraph that talked about amphibians and aquatics that essentially referenced you to an appendix. That appendix had 14 references. Where you look today, there's a whole lot more information about the guide, and I'll show you some of that information here in a second uh, associated with the zebrafish and aquatics and amphibians. But amphibians are used in a lot of different research. Um, everything from developmental studies, environmental toxins, maybe even using secretions for uh, therapeutics, um, models for pain studies, regeneration is another very common one. Um, a lot of these are focused and found in Dr. O'Rourke's article in the ILAR journal. But I'm going to focus a little bit on our amphibians, and that's this last point here, where our amphibians are actually being used for neuronal circuit mapping, because that's the focus of the entire research at the Genelia Research Campus. The guide, now I didn't quote the guide specifically. These are things in my words mostly, except for one point on there. Um, these are things that I pulled from the guide is that what I saw were important components as we think about our housing environments for our amphibians. There's two that are key. The first one being this sensitive skin mucus layer. Amphibians are very sensitive to anything that's in their environment, uh, anything that they're coming in contact with. And so as you think about what's going into your environment as you're housing these, you need to think about what is going to be that impact on their skin. Uh, you don't want to disrupt it in any way. You don't want them to scratch it in any way. Um, you don't, they, they have a lot of absorptive qualities of that skin where they're doing gas exchange, um, water exchange, a lot of that is happening through that skin. And as soon as you disrupt that, you start to create an opportunity for infections, diseases, um, and things that can really have a negative impact on your population. The other key component, which really isn't a whole lot different from the 1996 guide, is you really got to, and this is from the guide, you really got to look in the text in the journals and talk to experts. And I'm going to bring some of these journals to light at the very end. Um, but we got to start doing more learning from the zoological journals as well as from the wildlife journals. Because they're the ones that are putting more time and effort into the amphibian worlds than the laboratory uh, science groups because there's not much amphibian research that is taking place. So today I'm going to focus on the species that we have housed at Genelia. Um, here we have our two-line salamanders, three-line salamanders, long-tailed salamanders, and slimy salamanders. All four of those species are part of the lungless family. They don't have lungs. All they're doing, all their gas exchange through their skin. We also have housed tiger salamanders. Uh, they're part of the mole salamander family. Uh, we have some American toads, southern toads that we are housing right now. We've housed leopard frogs in the past, and of course, everybody's favorite amphibian, Xenopus. And I think when you saw this title, a lot of people were probably going to make the assumption that the focus was going to be here on the Xenopus. In fact, I'm not talking a single bit about Xenopus. There is a lot in the literature already about environmental enrichment and housing in Xenopus since it is one of the more popular amphibian models in the lab animal world. But I'm going to focus on our housing strategies for all these other species and kind of the evolution of some of those housing strategies and how they played a role in providing an enriched environment for those species. We're going to start here first with some of the first ones, those here in the Plethodontidae family, uh, those lungless salamanders. And this is 
our first housing environment for them. Um, and some of the thought processes we went through was that sensitive mucus layer or a sensitive skin, uh, making sure that that was intact, providing something that was, had some similarities to their natural environment. I liked what John said yesterday is that these environments are models. They're not exact replications. So this is how we can mimic that model uh, for them in the laboratory environment and still providing opportunities to feed, house, observe, see if there's any other interventions that we need to do. So this is just a uh, plexiglass tank uh, we had manufactured uh, that um, through our uh, machine shop. Uh, we also had a filter lid put on top that allowed gas exchange through the tank, um, but maintained the ability to keep the prey, the food source, which at that time was Drosophila, which you'll see here in a second. Um, we put this white piece of paper on the bottom. A lot of people were doing paper towels and stuff, but because of that ability to transport toxins into their skin, uh, not knowing what were the sources of those paper towels and how clean they were, we decided to use some of the rodent work and got this Texor bedding that's used often in the bottom of like uh, suspended caging. Um, and so we got this from kind of from our normal bedding supplier um, put that down. It was very absorptive, and the other, the key component of that was we soaked that heavily with water initially, so we could maintain the high levels of humidity that we needed in that environment as well. Um, we provided this rock here that was a, provided a spot for them to crawl in and hide, and that's where we found them most of the time. Um, and then the bottom part of the rock we had it separated, and that's where we filled their water, um, so they had a place that they could go in and completely submerge uh, if desired. Do a little close up, um, see the water dish here. You see some of the salamanders up here on the, the corner of the tank up high. Um, and if you look here in this Drosophila vial, there's one salamander in there that he was being very opportunistic and going down into that to get to his food source. Um, you can also see the tech zorb and how wet it is down here. And one of the things that we learned is as this got increasingly wet, as certain technicians might have put more water in it than others, we saw this behavior a lot more. So there was a fine balance between how wet and too wet. And so as we started to cut back on the moisture embedded in the tech sorb, uh, we started to see them spend a little bit more time down here hiding in the rocks because they're generally not going to want to climb up high. Um, but one of the other reasons they were climbing up high is the Drosophila that we were initially feeding, you know, were able to fly. And Drosophila have a negative geotaxis, which means they like to go high. They like to go away from gravity. So you would find all the Drosophila hanging around at the top of the tank. So they would go up there to get them. We eventually switched to a um, flightless variety of Drosophila so that they just kind of crawled around and they generally stayed a little bit lower, made it a little bit easier for them to catch their prey. Um, in addition to feeding the Drosophila, we would also provide them um, pinhead crickets for these smaller salamanders. So we transitioned. The researcher was using these specifically for prey capture behavior studies and he was wanting to move into understanding the visual stimulus. Um, and so there was a great model that has been used uh, for a while and that's the tiger salamander. Um, they've been used in retinal studies, uh, retinal ex vivo studies. Um, and so we needed to house them. They typically are housed in researchers' lab spaces. Uh, they're put in just regular aquatic tanks, fresh water, uh, with a filter. So we do have a filter on these that's your standard home aquarium style filter. It has all the same components of a zebrafish system with your mechanical filtration, your biological filtration, carbon filtration. The only thing it doesn't have is your ultraviolet uh, filtration components. Uh, but they're also housed at four degrees Celsius. And the reason for that is since they're housed in the laboratory environment uh, and not typically in an animal facility, it requires less maintenance. Um, it kind of puts them into a state of hibernation. Um, and they are typically using them within one to two weeks after arrival. Um, so that's how we started. What we found though is that some of these animals stayed around a little bit longer and their external gills 
would start to reabsorb. And that gave us that first clue that these animals were starting to go through metamorphosis. So we had to quickly adapt and find a way, how can we provide an environment for them so that they can continue on through the metamorphic stage and they become the adult salamander. And in order to do that, they would need then now an aquatic and a terrestrial type environment. Because of the nature of their skin, you know, and being from the mammalian world, which is most of my experience, you know, I was like, what are we gonna put there for the bedding? And to find something that was gonna be non-toxic and generally soft and safe, first thought, the alpha dry style beddings, those little white paper squares. Um, it's purified, it's, you know, it's not gonna have any contaminants, um, and it's gonna provide these guys that ability to burrow, because as the mole salamanders, they like to burrow and make those tunnels. So this was that first guy that was starting to metamorph. You can see he's got less external gills. Um, his dorsal fin or dorsal fin area is starting to regress as well. Um, you can see this side is the aquatic, this side is the terrestrial. Um, and this is a standard 20 gallon glass aquarium that we had our machine shop put a plexiglass divider in and seal it up. And what you can see, we put this little frog ramp or turtle ramp that you can get from an aquatic pet supply in there as well. Um, it allows him to climb up and get out on the terrestrial side and hang out up there or go back in onto the aquatic side and go back and forth. We would provide food pellets in the aquatic side as well as crickets on the terrestrial side for that guy. Um, we provided these red tubes that are often used in the rat world. Uh, we had some of them that hadn't been used and uh, provided an area for them to kind of crawl in where we'd still be able to observe them. And then once they became the fully terrestrial side, we got rid of the big aquatic environment for them and just had a big aquatic dish for them to, to um, soak themselves in. Um, and then we would often find the terrestrial guys completely buried underneath that aquatic dish. That's where they like to hide out most of the time. This aquatic side still had that same filtration. This is the, the um, supply water coming back into the system after it went through the filtration. Um, these guys are the largest salamander in America. So they can get to be about um, 12, 14 inches uh, in length. Their relative is the axolotl, which is very commonly used in research as well. Um, except the axolotl stays in that aquatic stage even into adulthood. So there were challenges with obtaining those smaller salamanders for the actual behavior. Um, they used the tiger salamanders for anatomy type experiments, but then wanting to have them to do prey capture behavior and understand that entire visual stimulus and going into the motor output for capturing the prey. Um, and so we needed a more reliable model that we could get. Um, which caused us to start looking at some of the various toad and frog species. Um, so we first started with some of the American toads. Um, and this system that you're going to see here is very similar to what we use now for the uh, southern toads, the Bufo terrestris. And so we, again, started back to where we were with the Plethodontides, the lungless salamanders. We had that same Texor paper. We have a shelter for them um, and a water dish. Uh, one of the differences is that we wrapped three sides of the tank with that aquarium style paper. The reason for that is your frogs and your toads, um, they, if they see a reflection of themselves, um, they can be aggressive, they are somewhat territorial, um, and they will go after and attack it, and they'll just hit that edge of the tank, thinking that is another intruder, um, and it'll cause damage to the rostrum. Uh, another way for opportunistic pathogens to get in. Uh, so you wrap three sides of it, and it provides them a little bit more of an enriched environment like they're used to. Um, but then we later learned that these guys actually probably prefer to burrow as well. Um, and so we switched to coconut husks, very common amphibian bedding that's used in the pet industry. Um, you know, again, from the rodent world, very concerned about contaminants in general. So I said, all right, I don't know where these coconut husks are coming from, so we're going to autoclave them first. So that's what we do. You know, we autoclave them, soak them in um, RO water, kind of reconstitute them back, and they're nice and fluffy, and it provides an, an area for them to burrow. Um, they still have the water dish. You can see that they do like to hang out in there. Um, and as you can see here, they really like to burrow. He's kind of just barely peeking his eyes up 
uh, right there in that middle picture. Now, one of the things with these toads is, and as with many amphibian species that are used in research, we don't have the great commercial vendors that are breeding these specifically for research. And so we're often looking for these from other sources. For these toads, they are very abundant in the environment and they are a very popular food source in the reptile uh, hobby industry. And so that's where we ended up getting a lot of these from. Now what happens is they do have parasites because they are wild caught. Um, and so we actually start them in our quarantine on this type that allows us to get fecal samples, allows us to look for parasites, allows us to do a very variety of treatments to try to help eliminate those parasites before we would transition them into this type of uh, housing. But because of that parasite load, well, I'll skip that, I'll come back to that in a second. Um, so we also had leopard frogs for a time being as they wanted to test to see which of those, the bufos or the leopard frogs would be better for the behavior. Um, and in these, because they like to have a little bit more of a uh, environment that had some running water to it, uh, they spent a little bit more time swimming than the toads did. So we kind of set up that same metamorphic style tank that we had for the tiger salamanders. Um, but we put gravel here because we knew that there could be concern if we had the alpha dry, the way that they would uh, go after the bedding. They could swallow it, might get some impaction, and we'd end up with some other health issues. Uh, this is kind of a neat video because these blue circles that you see on the screen, they're circling uh, little pinhead crickets that are in the tank with it. Um, you'll see two leopard frogs here, and this guy's first going to get this one, and then he's going to come over here and get this one. So it's kind of fun to watch them eat and hunt and uh, do that prey capture behavior. So they determined because they wanted a good tongue projection, uh, the leopard frogs didn't have a great tongue projection for them to do this prey capture behavior. They went back to the bufo species. Um, the bufo terrestris, the southern toads, seemed to be the best from what they saw in their behavior. And in using that, we decided all right, we want a way that we can have these uh, on a consistent basis because we really only could get them between March and September because then after that they're pretty much burrowing down and hibernating. Um, and we also wanted to make sure that they weren't, didn't have any parasites. So we decided let's look into what it would take to breed these ourselves. Um, so we established kind of a breeding protocol taking some uh, hints from some published papers on the Wyoming toad, an endangered species. Um, and we needed to set up specific tanks for them. Um, so we would do some hormone superovulations, uh, and there was a series of them that was gonna take place. And what we found, although that was successful in the literature for the Wyoming toad, for the southern toad, um, right after the very first hormone injection, she dropped all her eggs. Uh, so we had to adjust that over time. And we found that we were supposed to do some in vitro fertilization and squeezing urine from the males over top of those eggs to get the fertilization to take place. Um, but the ones that ended up being the most successful was with the superovulation and the hormones, uh, the ones that were engaged in natural mating behavior were ended up being the most successful. And so that natural mating behavior would take place in a tank like this that was mostly water. They had a little ramp that came up to a platform up here. We had some of the same coconut husk um, bedding up on top, um, but it, obviously you can see it ended up all in the water um, and kind of all around the eggs. These are all the eggs that were laid. But it did translate into some tadpoles. Uh, we first transitioned them into just petri dishes, um, held them there for a couple days, and as they got bigger, you can see that here are those tadpoles starting their metamorphic process, the development of the rear legs, um, and as soon as the forelimbs were developed and the tail had regressed a little bit, uh, we would then transition them to the terrestrial tank, uh, as you can see here. Um, you see there's two or three of these little toadlets used kind of a petri dish for the water. Um, and you can see they like to hang out in that as well. Food is a key component for the enrichment for these amphibian species. They're eating a wide variety of insects and bugs out in the wild. Um, crickets are very common, but we have, they're, they're not necessarily great nutritionally. So we end up using a variety of um, 
liquid and food sources for the crickets that are fortified uh, to help provide a better nutritive, nutritious source of crickets for the amphibians. But we've also started feeding uh, mealworms and waxworms that we would dust in a vitamin mineral powder as well before feeding it to them. And it's really cool. They really take after these waxworms. Um, we just kind of hold them on a pair of tweezers and they just, you know, every single time go right after it and eat. They'll eat two, three of those at a time. So not only is this concept of really looking at the literature and trying to understand the environment helped us on the amphibian side, we do have the fortune of working with some other unique species. Um, pygmy squid here, they're about, you know, only about an inch big, maybe a little bit smaller, as well as dragonflies. We house the dragonfly larvae, and then they emerge into full dragonflies where they're also used in prey capture behavior. But like I said, it's important to utilize your resources. Um, when you're dealing with amphibians, there's a great resource. There's an ILAR journal from 2007 that's completely dedicated to amphibians. Um, it's a fantastic resource. Um, Caudata.org, that's a place that I use to get a lot of my data and a lot of information for the initial housing. Um, but then starting to look at some of the animal behavior, I found a bunch of other papers that I have with me on some uh, territorial behaviors in, uh, I think they're redback salamanders. Um, and then also starting to look at some of the zoo biology, zoo literature, and the wildlife literature to really help you set up the best and optimal environment uh, in the laboratory setting for your amphibians. Thank you.